welcome to our talk, which is about fault tolerant integration of Apache Beam with relational database. Next slide, please. Hi, my name is Piao. I'm a software engineer at Niantic, working on infrastructure and the Niantic Lightship platform. Hi, my name is Savita. I work as a software engineer in Niantic's infrastructure team, as well as for distributed data processing. Uh, let me give you an intro about Niantic. Niantic's goal is to inspire people to explore the world together. Niantic obviously has a game studio as well as a platform. This platform is used to enable games to have geolocated data as well as a great AR experience. Let me cover the outline of a talk. In order to maximize the amount of time we, and the information we provide, we have pre-recorded this talk. We are going to cover why you might want to integrate Apache Beam with a relational database. We're going to look at some failed attempts at our attempt to do so. And we'll dis discuss our successful convergence on a solution. Then we'll discuss the results of those solution and share with you the lessons we learned while trying to do this. Next slide, please. So Niantic runs a bunch of data flow pipelines on input from users in order to detect malicious explorers and then provide a visualization to the games managers through a Grafana dashboard. That sounds like a simple task. Well, there are several problems. First of all, the data flow is run on a periodic basis, approximately once per hour. That data flow reads data that was written when the player was playing the game. The key thing to remember is that the data flow data processing time is not the same as when an event was triggered, which also might not be the same as the client action that originated on the client device. To make things complicated, Prometheus does not allow us to backdate metrics. In other words, when you issue the request to Prometheus, that's when that particular metric is recorded as the current timestamp. Finally, to complicate matters, we want to keep the cost of processing all that data from Niantic Explorers as low as possible in order to keep the platform viable. Next slide, please. Uh, let me take you through the whole core infrastructure data flow pipeline. So the Apache Beam pipeline has an input layer or an extraction layer where data is collected from certain flat files as well as edge based tables. In the transformation layer, the data collected in the previous layer has been applied some certain data manipulations or predefined conditions. On the output layer or the loading layer, all the data, man the results of the data manipulation is stored into GCP spanner or relational database for further analysis. Here are some statistics about what our pipeline covers. We cope regularly with millions of active explorers per hour. Those explorers in turn generate billions of trackable components that are then stored in big table. In order to store the history of each Niantic explorer, we keep that data in a spanner database consisting of 10 spanner nodes. Our goal is to get all those metrics from all those data flow into a single Postgres database. As previously mentioned before, we run a single data flow per hour per game. For our largest data flow, we make use of 200 virtual CPUs with 16 threads per CPU. For that particular data flow, it takes approximately 30 to 45 minutes per hour for each data flow. As you can imagine, we are under a hard real-time constraint. If we fall behind, there is potentially no easy way to catch up. Next slide, please. Okay, so here are a few of the attempted uh, implementations of setting up a metric system. So a data flow with Prometheus architecture 
So that's a pull metric system where when a, uh, the Prometheus constantly pulls the metrics from the Prometheus endpoint. That does not work since it has, uh, it expects we need to backdate the metrics according to the client time or any specific given time. Another method was, uh, another method of implementation that we tried was Prometheus with push gateway. How, what, how a push gateway works is uh, whenever the metrics is ready, it pushes to the push gateway and it's pulled by whatever the pull system is we are using. But the problem is again, here we do not, we cannot backdate to the date that is mentioned on the client or the event. Uh, we tried a couple of other methods by using remote storage, using GCP, BigQuery and Spanner. We came across a couple of limitations by either the quota or the API rate usage. The successful uh, method that we, we implemented was attaching Postgres as a time series database instead of Prometheus to store the metrics. We could customize the metrics according to the way we liked, and uh, we could customize also the date time uh, to the timestamp that we wish to, either the time, client timestamp or the processing timestamp, whichever based on the requirement of the metrics. We were ab also able to customize the metrics based on any number of parameters that we wish to customize it by. So when we actually tried to integrate Postgres with Dataflow, we discovered that a naive implementation didn't work. If you think about 200 threads with 16 CP workers per thread, that's 3,200 workers all trying to connect to your Postgres instance at one time. There is no relational database that can tolerate that kind of load. And what we discovered with Postgres SQL was that Postgres on GCP would reject connection requests after 150. Uh, if you try to use JDBC IO, you would read the documentation and discover that the beam runner would try to write multiple times in order to get fault tolerance. That means if you're using an insert statement to insert into the Postgres database, you are going to end up with duplicates. Furthermore, when you have more connections with a Postgres database, the amount of CPU utilization goes up. And even when we scaled out to the maximum capacity Google would give us, we could, we could not get a 3,200 worker data flow to connect correctly to the Postgres instance. Next slide, please. So what we realized was that we could use excess computation available in our workers in order to reduce the amount of load on Postgres. So the first thing we tried was to use combiners to combine all the metrics in one category into, into smaller pieces of data and then use prepared statements to do batch inserts into the Postgres database. Uh, this actually worked acceptably well, but the latency was high. What would happen was that a global combiner would wait for all the import to be read and processed before it would start writing to the Postgres database. We discovered then that with the with fanout option, you could the system would actually start writing to the Postgres database without having to wait for all the input to come in. Now, the problem is that the with fanout option takes input a single integer that is mysteriously referred to in the documentation as nodes. If you naively think that, oh, this is the number of workers that will be assigned to each hotkey or each fanout, you would be wrong. We discovered that it would each increment in that number would end up with an exponentially increasing number of workers trying to connect to Postgres and that would bring you quickly back to the situation you, we discussed earlier. So after a bunch of trial and error, we discovered that a with fan out number of two was sufficient to give us a lot of workers running against Postgres. To take a belt and suspenders approach, we also added code that detected if a connection request failed and would, we would retry the connection request uh, up to three times if that connection request failed. 
in practice, we discovered that if we kept the fan out low, uh, we would never actually fail any connection requests. Next slide, please. So here is an example of the code that as it looked like on the left before we applied these optimization. And then what you see on the right is code that, that we, we did after applying both, the, both combiners with fan out. So the first combiner would combine all events of the same type together into a single key. And then the second would collect all the events and initiate the Postgres writes. Next slide, please. Uh, here are the results after a successful implementation. So we had over-provisioned our instance. So we scaled that instance down to the bare minimum of 12 virtual CPUs and 48 uh, GB in memory. We were also able to, uh, we were no longer uh, bottlenecked on write performance. So we were able to batch insert faster than GCP's BigQuery streaming insert. We saved a lot of compute cost. We improved the latency over GCP uh, BigQuery. The overall uh, data flow lapse time also improved. That made us thinking about like re replacing all our existing BigQuery usages in the repository to use Postgres instead. Uh, when we were porting to other cloud providers other than GCP, we, were, we did not need to make any code changes since Postgres is same over any cloud provider. Uh, the fix, there was also a fixed cost around any SQL queries or any analytical queries uh, using Postgres as Postgres is not charged per query and it's per instance for the amount of CPU or RAM that we are allocating. A typical data flow numbers looks like this. When we have billions of Niantic explorers, we kind of generate around millions, or when you have millions of Niantic explorers, we kind of generate around millions of trackable units. From those trackable units, we kind of make historic units or, or measuring metrics, which is around six, mil, uh, 6 million of those per 30 seconds. And when you batch insert that in under 30 seconds, it'll be around 11,000. And the inserts per second was around a thousand. Uh, the transactions per second on a main instance will always be between two, uh, 100 or to 150 uh, transactions per second. The CPU utilization on the main instance for 12 virtual CPUs was always under 30 to, to uh, under 40 to 30 percentage of the CPU utilization. Uh, here are a few refinements we did on, on our progress. Uh, first, initially when we started the approach, we were using JSONB to store all the columns of the metrics. Uh, since we did not know how many of how many metric units or how many measurable units we need to store. Once we were able to stabilize that, we were able to convert from JSONB columns to relational database columns. Uh, this also enabled us to do a lot of data normalization. We went to went through the star schema and normalized the data so that we do not store uh, duplicate repetitive data, which will scale up our storage utilization. We also introduced uh, table indexing, which allowed us to improve our query performance. Uh, as uh, we also added a lot of data. Uh, infrastructure hardening mechanisms so that we had better alerting and monitoring against GCP Cloud SQL Postgres outages. So uh, we, as previously mentioned, we had scaled up our instance so much that we scaled it back down. So uh, scaled our over-provisioned Postgres instance. So to summarize, here are the lessons we learned during this period. Uh, Postgres has an approximate limit of about 100,000 appends per second when attached to an SSD on Google Cloud SQL. Uh, as long as you're under the limit, uh, you can use Postgres as a right, right sync for your data flow. If you exceed the limit, you need to use a different solution like Bigtable or Spanner. If you're doing read modify writes, that write bandwidth is much reduced Hence, for our Explorer component state database, we stayed with Spanner. Having said that, you shouldn't be afraid to use Postgres with Dataflow. We, it turns out that we can do writes at scale to, date, to Postgres if you properly organize your data flow and make use of combiners with hotkey fanouts. Uh, unlike 
BigQuery or Spanner or Bigtable, uh, you can get Postgres at all cloud platforms. And furthermore, you don't have to worry about cost constraints when you're querying Postgres uh, or making use of prepaid query slots. When we used BigQuery, at one point, we forgot to make use of our prepaid slots and we got a surprise bill at the end of the month that was much higher than expected. Finally, in the open source deployment world, Grafana is frequently paired with Postgres. Uh, Grafana is frequently paired with Prometheus. We discovered that you don't actually have to use Prometheus with Grafana all the time. You can use Grafana and attach it to any time series database. And there's a large number of those that you can explore. You do not have to use Postgres. And Grafana can even issue alerts without Prometheus in the picture. The alerts are basically based on the queries you set up in the Grafana dashboard. And next slide, please. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and that you had, and that it was informative. If the problems we discussed are interesting to you, uh, I would like to give a plug for Niantic. Uh, we are indeed hiring and we have a link here to our Niantic openings website. Uh, if you are interested, please reach out and, you, and uh, maybe you get to join the team. Thank you very much. Thank you.